Music. It's the love of music that brings us together. The love of music that forms the bond between us. For the next hour, join us for the love of music, presenting those aspects of music which excite, provoke, and inspire. Our host today is David Dubow, WNCN music director, pianist, educator, and writer on music. Here is David Dubow for the love of music. Today on this program, we are lucky enough to hear Daniel Pollock play the Prokofiev Third Sonata, Liszt Paganini Etude, a Debussy piece, Winter Wind Etude of Chopin, and maybe other things. Daniel Pollock is in New York. He was on our program September 5th, and it was a great program, Danny. Thanks very much, Dan. How are you? Fine. <laughs> I know why you're here. Always, when you're anywhere, you're pianistically oriented. Right. And you're here to more or less push a little bit the movie that you are the star of, at least the soundtrack of, and that is The Competition. Right. That's a film playing here in New York that just opened a few weeks ago, and I'm playing the Prokofiev Third Concerto and a lot of other things like the Liszt E flat, the Sansons G minor, and several solo things. But the credit on the film shows the Prokofiev Three, and we did that in California with the Los Angeles Philharmonic with Lalo Schifrin conducting, who did the original soundtrack. You know, the actual title, competition, in America, of course, this word is not a bad word because we consider competition the, the way of life itself. And yet, for the artist, the competition is a trying force in their lives, and many of the pianists and violinists and other instrumentalists to have a career have to win competitions. Of all people, you best, <laughs> who, who has played in this movie, The Competition, with, who is it, Richard Dreyfuss? Richard Dreyfuss, yeah. Amy Irving. It's lead. gotten very good reviews, yes. and I want to see it very much, especially to see if they coordinate the hands with your playing. Well, approximately. It's yeah. a hard feat to accomplish, especially a lot of the difficult repertoire that was chosen for the film. Yeah. I'm sure he worked hard at it. Oh, yes. Good craftsman that he is as yes. an actor. Marvelous. Um, but you have been in competitions. You lost a big one to Van Cliburn, but you were the only other American to win in the most important competition of the 50s. That was the Tchaikovsky. But you have won many a competition. What is this form of life? Uh, I think you have to be born to be in competitions. Am I right? Yes, you have to have a certain, be trained like a racehorse yes, almost. Yes, a, a thoroughbred to right, do this. Right, But even if you refer to the Tchaikovsky as a loss, I mean, what's what's a loss and what's a win? Yeah. You can still be a loser and a, and a winner and a winner and a loser. Many things happen out of competitions, both positively and negatively, for those in the career know that. And I don't think that that's the beginning of the road or the end of the road because of course it launches one's career and the other is to prove oneself mm -hmm. after such a launching and that's a tall order right there but the star-studded system that we are used to which is one of the avenues and probably the most important one to make a career is perilous and many times a young artist maybe even 18 19 20 wins one and then in a few years is totally forgotten about yeah. And different careers emerge uh, differently, actually. How do different careers emerge without the competition, without the recording contract, in an era which is so difficult to build a career? There are several avenues, of course, as we mentioned the competition. The second would be like Glenn Gould issuing the Goldberg Variations for, through a recording. That's, of course, that's a unique example. That's a very a unique. A 21-year-old pianist who becomes absolutely famous through over, this. Yeah. Through a record. That's yeah. possible. It wouldn't rare. have happened, would it, in any other way for him? I don't think so. Right. It I had don't to think be so. that record, or, uh, or it wasn't a competition type. No, especially playing a work like the Bach Goldberg. Yeah. But another would be as a last minute replacement with an orchestra. Like Bernstein became with, famous because of the Walter or Watts. Or with, Watts or something like that. That also. But that doesn't happen every day, and there are no. thousands of pianists that have already come through your hands as a teacher sure. in your career. And I've done a lot of last minute replacements too, as, as a matter of fact. But you're an established concert pianist. What about these students who, who you have? What do you tell them? You're studying, you're working eight hours a day, your, your arms are falling off, you have great aspirations, you were told as a child prodigy you too will be Horowitz. How do you handle that because it's not handled well you know no, Daniel I think the key is stamina number one emotionally and physically that's what it takes to make a career and one without the other is not good do you think uh, it's true that real talent cannot be stifled because I, I don't believe that you mean will it emerge anyhow yes yeah, but it needs the chance to be heard. Oh, it sure does. And it that's so many things to happen. The timing, exactly. the lucky breaks, who hears you when and where in the right time, the right place. Yeah. 
in the old days when courts were used as the, how should I say, entree for the public to be invited, like you you, you read of uh, Chopin and Liszt in the days and Schubert and composers as such. We're hoping the government does that, but that's not the answer, and neither is private industry have come in a great deal to help the arts naturally, foundations, the college, university circuit of building a career. All of these are not necessarily one avenue. I think a combination of things which builds a, a steady career is several of these components. It's hard to predict which one will be the driving force at that point. I think I mentioned stamina as one thing, especially in this jet age where you, you have to play in New York one day and Tokyo the next day, and artists appear all over the world in, in a hop, skip, and a jump fashion now, which they're expected to do. So it's put an extra pressure on careers. Versatility. I think that we have to be very adaptable to not just a career in Carnegie Hall as such, but a teaching profession, a chamber music, keeping up with the times, being as diverse as possible. That's easier said than done. But uh, many students, I think, need to explore that area that they should be familiar with as many facets of their art as possible. I don't mean just in performing, but in the studies of the related arts, too. And often they're not. Bizzoni once said that pianists think that if they have, you know, seven or eight pieces and they play them well, they deserve a career. Right. It's yeah. a little more than that. Some careers it? have been built on just that. Yes, but not now, not in 1981. Not exactly. No, it's no. another world. Yeah. But I think that gearing the repertoire to one's personality or charisma or however you want to put it, the temperament of an artist mm -hmm. with the guidance of an expert teacher, because not everybody should play everything or everything you study doesn't have to be performed, where you play what piece when. These are great decisions and take a lot of thought behind them. And a lot of this is done by instinct. Mm -hmm. We teach by instinct, we listen by instinct, we either like something or we don't like it. Sometimes we don't know the answer, what, what is the reason for it, and sometimes I don't think there is an answer. I mean, if you go to a gallery and you see a gorgeous painting, it hits you, or it doesn't. And it's very subjective. A lot of, of art is. What somebody thinks is absolutely fantastic, you could ro walk right by it and not notice it. Is there a great future in your mind for pianists going to conservatories and learning the Beethoven sonatas and having aspirations to perform in the great centers or in the small ones? All of us have to feel that we're making some sort of contribution, even in the worst of times. And I just did a concert recently in Houston for the benefit of the pediatric surgery department of one of the universities at Jones Hall. And I saw the work that these pediatric surgeons are doing, and I thought, they're doing a better work than I am. And what a great gift to save lives of infants. And the doctor, Brooks, who's in charge of that hospital, who's very famous, said to me, you're doing equally. Don't forget medicine and art are very closely related. She says, we heal them physically, and you heal them in their soul and in their spirit. And she How said, beautiful. And that was really very well said. And she said, what we practice, oh, can we, well, of course, done with love, can only be done up to a point. Mm -hmm. And when you think of it in those terms, then I think it's, it's a very important aspect that we can bring something to enrich, because the arts do enrich our lives. And if that message is sincere, I think it will touch anybody who's ready to receive it. You have to be open to that. When you are open, the arts can be a potent force. Very. It's like, really, a religious experience. You know, we're going to have you play different of the works of your repertoire today, and in the competition, you played the Prokofiev Third Piano Concerto, which right. someone, I think Rudolf Gantz once said, was the Grieg A minor of the 20th century. <laughs> it has such an impact. But we're going to hear a recording that you made in Russia, probably, as you say, uh, three in the morning, right? Right, something like that. <laughs> and it's of really uh, Not remade. This is a first and only take. <laughs> one take. One Amazing. Take. They do it a little differently there, huh? They did then, I don't they know. They sure did. And... <laughs> It's the Prokofiev Third Sonata, he wrote nine, and the third and the seventh and the second are the ones I think most played. The third is such a solid one-movement work, it's Very. about eight minutes. We're going to hear Daniel Pollock, my guest today, 
in the Prokofiev Piano Sonata Number no. 3.
My guest, the artist who just played the Prokofiev Third Piano Sonata, Daniel Pollock, and this was, ironically enough, <laughs> done during the Tchaikovsky competition. Right. In 58. Way back way in, when in 58, right. Yes, and you made several recordings in Russia. You had wonderful tours in Russia. Richter himself, one of my idols, the great Sviatoslav, and I'm sure one of your idols. Of course. In a league of his own, hey? Right. Said of your playing of this in French when he wrote a review, when he heard you do the seventh and the third, he said, oh, this is no longer piano playing. This is the play of the devil. <clears throat> He was very impressed with your feeling for, for Prokofiev. Prokofiev. Yes, yeah, and very much so. He that, said it was always misunderstood somewhat by Western audiences that Prokofiev, as we talked earlier, is a strong lyricist. Mm -hmm. That the driving element is always the more apparent, but the one that we should look for. It's, it reminds me of Berg. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the romantic twelve-tone right, right. composer. Would, uh, Richter, you said to me, is a wonderful painter. I didn't yes, know that. I visited his apartment in Moscow and saw some wild-looking paintings that reminded me of Van Gogh, sort of left-bank Parisian influence. Uh, very interesting and very colorful man. Now, on our last program, Daniel Pollock, we discussed your great success this year as the first American to tour... Mainland China, right. In, my God, how long? Over 30 years. They haven't had a solo artist there. Richter was there, actually, but he was an, not American, of course. Right, and a lot came appearing with orchestra. This yeah. was a total solo tour. Now, we talked about that in September, and right. we talked about your recording on Columbia, but after the China Syndrome, what's happening? And, well, there'll and be a new a recording out of the original soundtrack album from the movie of the competition. It should be released on MCA Records around the 1st of February, and hmm. we'll carry... The Prokofiev III, the Beethoven Emperor, uh, original score by Lalo Schifrin, mm -hmm. the theme song of the competition. This movie romanticizes piano playing, right? right? As somebody said, it's the turning point for the music world. <laughs> I see. Do you think it's going to cause a run on piano teaching? I <laughs> hope so. Okay. And everything else related to piano. As a Steinway artist, I'm delighted to see the Steinway listed so predominantly oh. in the film. Well, I'm sure that they are. <laughs> of course. <laughs> delighted to have that listed. Now, competitions mean that, of course, pianists have to study long time to get into them. It also enlarges their repertoire. Which yeah. is very You're quite a teacher, and I know that. And you teach at an important university in... In California, right? Yeah. USC. And you get three, five, ten, fifteen, how many students a year that, you know, are new? I have a very big talent now from Peking, who came to really? me just now. Right. Because of your playing there? Right, of course. How interesting. Yeah. These, these little connections. Right. <laughs> the China connection. Right. The world is very small, believe it or not. Now, we have so many Chinese, Korean, Japanese pianists. Right. They have all of the sudden emerged. But you know, it's not just an instant happening. The piano gained uh, impetus in Japan as early as about 1895, and the first Yamaha right. was built in 1900. Do you know there are more of these pianos played than any piano in the world? Because do you know that in Japan, you have the world's greatest production of pianos yearly of any country on earth? Right. Does that surprise you? No, but the ones that are fewer made and more handcrafted are more impressed with. <laughs> well, yes, but we're talking about the fact that so many entries into piano playing are Japanese, right. Korean. Well, I think part is also they have the discipline for the study. This mm -hmm. is what I'm sure most How people come? do to their background and their culture. And I think the part that we strive to work with the most is to bring out the feeling and to get them to project. Mm -hmm. I think this is a, the, the most important area. It's improving, but still that... Is it new to them, this music still? Mm, is yes it, and is no. it in the blood, so to speak, like a pole with Chopin? It's a hard question to yeah. answer. I would say no, mm -hmm. it's not in their blood. But and they love it. Yes, but... You know, classical music in Japan is about 25% of all records sold, while in uh, America it's about three and a half. Right. Well, that, that's... Well, things are happening there, classical music-wise. Well, if we had more FM stations around the country like yours, that wouldn't just be heard in large metropolitan centers. Isn't this a phenomenal station? Yes, I wish it would be carried in other places. I wish it was carried all through the world, WNCN. There's a composer dear to you, and on your recording, 
Debussy. Right. Do you play this composer much? Very much. I'm drawn to composers that have a color, nuance, who use the resources of the instrument in, in tonal moods. Of course, he's paramount in that area. So is Chopin, Liszt, Brahms. I love the colorists of the piano. Is Debussy the last of the great contributors to the fulfillment of what the resources of the piano no. could be? Who is in your... The last? I don't yeah. think there is a last You yet. still think that the piano as an instrument that exhausted. has a future? Oh, sure. You do, good. Oh, sure. But you don't play John Cage or, or no. Cowell, any tone cluster or any plucking? No, that's not music to me. But in a sense, you see, with after Debussy, what have we had? that really has exploited the coloristic aspect Ravel. of the... Ravel. Yeah, but they were really... They were practically rivals in their own day. Yes. Uh, Messian? Nope. You don't think so? Well, not for me. Uh -huh. I, music has to speak for me. I remember talking with Mark Schubert one day when we were at the Juilliard School together, and once I was working on a contemporary work, and he said to me, do you love this piece? Uh -huh. And I said, yes. He says, and that's what you should advocate. There are plenty of pianists around who will play George Crumb and other composers, uh, David Diamond or whoever, you have to be drawn to that composer. Yeah. It's like you're a champion of that work. And yes. that dedication to a work is very important. Otherwise, there's no sense in performing it. I don't think you as an artist can uh, identify in projecting that uh, composer, and certainly the audience will feel that. Yeah. I quite understand that, and there have not been really enough champions of any specific 20th century composers that, you know, have, have not, so to speak, made it. The pianist has become a curator of the museum, and the, not many of them, unfortunately, have looked into the 20th century literature. True, but... There's a lot done that we don't know about and just is languishing around. Right, and uh, there's a lot that should be languishing still. In any age, in any age. <laughs> right. But however, W.C. indeed is not languishing. He is, every piece <laughs> Very he wrote much is, alive. is in the repertoire. And we are going to hear a fabulous, without doubt, fabulous performance of Fudart de Fies, Fireworks, the last of the W.C. preludes. Am I correct? It's the last one. That's right, it? in book two. Book two, and here it goes.
Daniel Pollock playing Fudarte Fils of Debussy, French composer, French to the core. Absolutely. Daniel, we have to now leave for some commercial messages. And if you will deign the world of Debussy. <laughs> yes, and if you deign to stay <laughs> on, we'll continue talking to you right after these messages. We heard you and Debussy, and of course Debussy was one of the great composers for the piano, and he didn't have the middle sostenuto pedal that was created in the 1880s by Steinway. He had an Erard piano, and most Europeans don't have that pedal. When you played this piece, or when you played Debussy or other modern composers, this is just for my curiosity and for other pianists, do you use that middle pedal, which uh, Joseph Hoffman, for instance, took off the piano when he played a concert for fear of stepping on it? <laughs> Uh, of course I use it. You do? Sure. How oh, interesting. The piano cool. has 88 keys and three pedals. You use everything. How interesting. <laughs> well, that solves that. We are going to now hear a piece. Well, certainly, this has a difficulty to it, not only technically, but it was an Italian folk tune that Paganini used as part of his violin concerto in B minor, which Liszt, when he heard him play it, was so envious that I must try to put such a thing onto the piano. And then when Buzzoni heard it, he said, well, Liszt did a great job in transcribing the Paganini, but it's a little too ungrateful for the hands, and I think I will make it a less unwieldy. So this piece is Paganini, Liszt, Buzzoni, and it's the celebrated what? La Campanella. La Campanella. And speaking of uh, pianos, we were talking about the Sassanudo pedal. La Campanella certainly is a product of the great Erard invention in the early 1820s, which made the piano supple enough to have these kind of repeated notes and would be too bad if the notes didn't repeat. <laughs> yes. And you were telling me about a recent concert, very recent in Oregon, about something like this. And after your performance here of La Campanella, we will talk a little bit about hazards of, of touring. touring. Right. Okay. Here is La Campanella. Daniel Pollock, my guest today, is the pianist.
Lavelle's La Campanella, and it was Paganini, Liszt, Buzzoni in the hands of Daniel Pollock, who is of that classification. <laughs> and of course, you must be if Richter said you were devilish and you're playing a Prokofiev, because certainly Paganini the devil, was the, the devil, they said. In right. fact, you know, Paganini was of such, of course, showmanship level, but he was also living in the early 18th century, and superstition was a little bit rampant, and you know, he had to publish letters hmm. that he had mortal parents. Think of it. <laughs> it's unbelievable. After we live this, in different times. <laughs> very different. After this message, we will come back to these times with a performance of, and fittingly, the winter wind etude of Chopin. A good friend of mine today is my guest, Daniel Pollock, but that's irrelevant. He happens to be one of the fine American pianists. He himself thinks great. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> On the contrary, you're one of the most modest of men. You studied, of course, with Joseph Levine and Rosina Levine. And well, I played for Joseph two weeks before he passed away in California in uh -huh. 1944. Mm -hmm. No, my major study was with Madame Levine. And your admiration was well discussed on our program we did in September. Right. One of Levine's great recordings is The Winter Wind, and I think that I hear that I don't want to use the word influence because you yourself don't like to have any student be influenced right? by yourself. But this indeed has that kind of fantastic wintry quality that all you have to do is know the Levine recording. <laughs> <laughs> Apropos for this time of the year. <laughs> We're going to hear your recording, and this one made in Russia at 4.15 in the morning. With six feet of snow on the ground. Yeah, in Leningrad or Moscow? Moscow. Okay, here is Daniel Pollock in his recording of Chopin's Opus 25, number 11. Chopin never said winter wind, right. but it has that howl, doesn't it? Oh, it sure does. <laughs> Thank you. 
Ah, that's the wintry effects of the winter wind etude, Chopin's A minor etude. You know that when Schumann first heard that piece, it didn't have that little introduction before the great crash. Hmm. Very interesting. You said to me that you did as Levin did, which was that great run at the end. You played it instead of one octave apart as written, you played it two octaves apart. Right. And you add the pedal halfway up, so it gives the effect of the crescendo. So this is where, of course... Otherwise, you accumulate too many bases. <laughs> the romantic pianism of a Levine was shown to you through a Rosina Levine on this piece, obviously. Right. Superb teacher. You had no guilts about changing the text of the master or any of that, of right? Of course not. Right. It's the effect there that counted. I think one has to know... When? When to change what and why. <laughs> and now let's have a commercial message or two... And here is our announcer. This is David Dubal, and my guest is Daniel Pollack. And we have had, on the two programs we have done, one in September and today, Prokofiev and Paganini and Rachmaninoff. It's and, a festival uh, of romantic music here. Yes, but you know, no German <laughs> composers. I think we should have one. What okay, shall we, fine. What shall we do? How about the Brahms? F sharp minor capriccio? Right. that sounds good. Oh, okay. This is an interesting piece. What does capriccio mean? I think capricious, but mm -hmm. the I, I've often thought of these character pieces for the piano that many that are marked as such are a different world from the title that they have. Mm -hmm. And intermezzos are capriccios, and capriccios are intermezzos. <laughs> a couple of those intermezzos are almost sonata allegro forms. Right, right. Brahms couldn't resist, even when he was at his most intimate and being also very intellectual. Now, what is this bit that students, of course, we had this occasionally at Juilliard, that students are not really allowed to play Brahms until they're very mature? As a teacher, when someone brings to you Brahms, what do you do? Introduce it as early as possible. I see. <laughs> to me, it's one of the pillars of the repertoire, the uh -huh. intermezzi, capriccios, rhapsodies, ballades. They're very important. Let's hear you play the F-sharp minor capriccio, a work I adore. Me too. Daniel Pollock, the artist.
Brahms F sharp minor capriccio opus 76 and that's the first of that group and right. we we are through today Daniel Pollock we have to get going because we're running over as they say well thank you David it was always a pleasure to be here with you and and it's always a pleasure to have you stimulating as, as my guest thank you bye and this is David Dubois thank you very much for listening for the love of music with today's host David Dubois WNCN music director we hope you'll be with us when once again we meet to listen and exchange ideas, all for the love of music. For the Love of Music is produced by WNCN New York, GAF Broadcasting Company.